we'll go ahead and get started with prayer and uh, we'll move on from there. Gracious God and King, once again tonight you uh, gather us around your word. We pray that you would use this time together in your word to fortify us with your truth and your love, your grace and faith in you as given to us in Jesus, the crucified and risen one. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, we're at uh, Ezekiel chapter 24. Now, a few things to say about Ezekiel 24. Um, of course, there are 20 more, 24 more chapters left in this book. Uh, but this really is the culminating um, chapter of everything that has preceded it in that um, the whole book has been moving toward this moment of uh, judgment on Jerusalem and Judah, the people of God, uh, which really is the culminating judgment of the entire people of Israel, which we saw meted out originally in uh, 722 BC against the Northern Kingdom. Uh, from here, we're going to move into the middle section of Ezekiel. And I anticipate that going rather quickly. Chapters 25 to 32. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we get into chapter 25 here in a second. And then chapters 33 to 48, <coughs> excuse me, everyone. <coughs> chapters 33 to 48 present us with uh, the gospel. It's the promise of restoration and resurrection and so forth. And uh, things are going to get uh, grim uh, before we get there. But 33 to 48 present those promises of God who is good for his promises. So we'll get into that. Hi, Betty. Right now, it looks like you and I are it. So uh, uh, we're recording for people to look at later at this point. So if you've got anything you want to shout out at me, uh, Betty, just let me know. So we'll go ahead and get started here on chapter uh, 24, verse 1. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Let's just stop there for a second. So uh, we've commented before about how Ezekiel will uh, frequently mention specific dates. We know the specific date here. I think I mentioned it last night. It's January 15. Um, uh, oh, shoot. Is it 588 B.C.? Uh, it's, hi, Linda. It's a year and a half before, or two years and a half, rather, before the actual fall of Jerusalem. And what's beginning now is that Babylon is laying siege to Jerusalem. And we talked about all of the seeds that were planted that, that led to this moment. So uh, God is letting Ezekiel know that the siege has begun. He wouldn't have known otherwise. No messenger would have brought that news so quickly. And uh, it's going to be six months after uh, Jerusalem finally falls in 586 BC uh, before a messenger comes to confirm that news. We'll talk about that more as we go through this. So now comes uh, an image, rather strange image, but an understandable one nonetheless, that God creates of Jerusalem and its inhabitants. So I'm at verse 3. Thus says the Lord God, Set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also, put it in, uh, in it 
the pieces of meat, all the good pieces, the thigh and the shoulder, fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest one of the flock, pile the logs under it, boil it well, seethe also its bones in it. So the imagery here is, and this is an enacted kind of uh, parable or at least a visualized parable uh, that God is giving. He's portraying Jerusalem as a, a cooking pot and all of the bones and the flesh, the meat inside, are its inhabitants. And this is pointing to the conflagration that's going to happen at Jerusalem. Verse 5, excuse me, verse 6. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose corrosion is in it, and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. Take out of it piece after piece without making any choice. So here what we see is the idea that people uh, in Jerusalem are going to be set to the four winds and it won't make any difference what their status was. And even if they may not be directly involved in all of the evil that God has charged against his people up to this point in the book, they are complicit in it. Uh, you remember at the Nuremberg trials, one of the defenses that some of the defendants there tried was that they were simply following orders. Um, I think many Christians look at what's going on in the church today at large, uh, whatever extreme versions of the church there may be, and uh, say, well, that's not really part of us, that we're not really involved in that. And yet these are people speaking in the name of Christ. And unless we make clear what God's actual biblical truth is, we are, in effect, complicit. And so it's important for us to speak clearly, as the uh, uh, Lutheran Confessions say, to ensure that our churches proclaim the gospel rightly and uh, administer the sacraments rightly. So uh, now notice he describes it as the bloody city. He's described it as the city of blood before. Uh, the meaning of that uh, is maybe a little obscure, but I think there are multiple meanings associated with it. First of all, Jerusalem was to be the city of God or the holy city. Now here's God describing it as a bloody city. Uh, this can reference, as we've seen before, the blood guilt of Jerusalem and Judah when it comes to uh, sacrifices made to false deities like Moloch or um, its complicity in sin and in uh, the execution of fake justice. In other words, um, bringing about the deaths of people who are not really um, guilty of anything. They may be sojourners and strangers from other places and so forth, and they just trump up charges against them, and uh, that's blood guilt. The other thing about it is that in any cooked food, and the imagery here is of, uh, you know, something being cooked, um, according to the Jewish dietary laws, there could be no blood in the meat. That all had to be removed from it before it was considered clean. So this gets at the uncleanness of the people of God if, with all of their corrupt practices and worship abominations and so forth that we've talked about a lot. Verse 7, For the blood she has shed in her midst, she put it on the bare rock, she did not pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. So in other words, when these sacrifices to these false deities were made, which were completely contrary to the will of God, or when this uh, injustice was uh, done against people and their blood was shed, 
there was no attempt to conceal uh, the wrongdoing. It was done openly and arrogantly. Now, <laughs> I, I've sometimes teased about people who, uh, who uh, uh, talk badly about others and don't have the decency to do it behind their backs. Now, of course, I'm kidding. Uh, the Eighth Commandment forbids us from bearing false witness, which includes gossip and so forth. But the point is that uh, when we do wrong, if we have any kind of a sense of right and wrong, or if we acknowledge uh, a sense of right and wrong, or a uh, acknowledge the authority of God over our lives, we're not going to want other people to know about our wrongdoing. I'm not saying that people should engage in cover-ups. What I am saying is what's going on in Jerusalem is the people are so brazen in their uh, disregard for the will of God and so brazen in their disregard uh, for uh, their disregard for uh, of God's commands for uh, being just and loving and not murdering, that they just murder openly. And we have seen over the years in various political movements around the world that some people in high positions of power are able to get away with all manner of horrible stuff by, by normalizing what they do. So, you know, people began to think in Germany that it was no big deal that Hitler was um, imprisoning and killing Jews and so on and so forth. Um, what has happened in Jerusalem is that evil and murder and child sacrifice have been normalized. And so no one thinks anything of allowing the stains of uh, blood, of uh, human sacrifice and injustice, the evidence of it to still be seen on the rocks. Verse 8, to rouse my wrath, to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed, that it may not be covered. God is not going to allow it to be concealed. And they will see, the people will see one of the reasons why uh, God is coming after them. You remember in Genesis, when Cain killed his brother Abel, we're told that God said that the blood of Abel cried out to him in heaven. One of the big themes in biblical history is that blood, which is affirmed by medical science, of course, uh, is, is the life force of human beings. It carries life. And this is part of the why, reason why Christ gave to us his body and blood in Holy Communion. So here we see that God is going to allow the blood of those who have been unfairly murdered and slain to act as a witness against his people for their injustice and their idolatry and the reason why he is punishing them now. Verse 9, Therefore thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city! I also will make the pile great. Heap on the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix in the spices and let the bones be burned up. Then set it empty upon the coals that it may, it may become hot and its copper may burn, that its uncleanness may be, may be melted in it, its corrosion consumed. So what God is saying here is not only will the inhabitants of Jerusalem die or be condemned to uh, exile and to become part of the diaspora, the dispersed people, but Jerusalem itself, including the temple, are going to be totally destroyed. And of course, when the Babylonians enter Jerusalem, they're going to destroy everything with fire. Verse 12, she has wearied herself with toil. Its abundant corrosion does not go out of it. 
into the fire with its corrosion on account of your unclean lewdness, because I would have cleansed you and you were not cleansed from your uncleanness. You shall not be cleansed anymore till I have satisfied, satisfied my fury upon you. So God is saying, and we've seen this uh, in the prophets, we've seen it repeatedly in biblical history and all of the books of history in the Old Testament, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, Exodus, you name it. Time and time again, God calls his people to repentance and they will sporadically and then they turn right away from God to uh, worshiping false idols and so forth. I would have willingly cleansed you, God said, but you wouldn't want to do it. You did not want to be cleansed. You did not want to repent. And so your whole city uh, is going to be consumed. Judah is going to be destroyed. Verse 14, I am the Lord. I have spoken. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. I will not spare. I will not relent. According to your ways and your deeds, you will be judged, declares the Lord God. This, of course, is not God saying that we're saved by works. What God is saying is, here is a people who have chosen not to uh, take advantage of the grace that God offers and have instead tried to go their own way while still thinking that they could rely on God because of his promises. But they didn't need to make any promises. They didn't need to trust. God is saying, I have decided. And he affirms that numerous times in just those last few verses. Uh, there, in, Well, just in verse 14, over and over again, this is going to happen. Now we have a, a strange thing and a tragic and horrible thing in many ways. On the morning, we believe, that Ezekiel shared this oracle with the exiles in Babylon, we have what comes next. Verse 15. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh, but not aloud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban and put your shoes on your feet. Do not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And on the next morning, I did as I was commanded. You know, the prophets were called to a very difficult life. Jeremiah, who is a, who's roughly contemporary with Ezekiel, just a little older than Ezekiel, and who remained in Judah uh, throughout this period when Ezekiel is prophesying, he often uh, talked about his own personal feelings and lamented the fact that God was asking him to take on this burden. Uh, and he was told by God that uh, he should not marry. So he was saddled with this command from God uh, to, to not marry so that his focus could be on the word of God. Uh, Ezekiel was married, and yet what God is going to do is he's going to use the death of Ezekiel's wife uh, in a parabolic way. We'll talk about that in just a second. Isaiah um, uh, was uh, married and had children and was told to give names to his children that reflected the prophecy that God was giving to him. Hosea was told to marry a prostitute who would represent or symbolize the unfaithfulness 
of Israel to God. Now, with Ezekiel, we have a, a different kind of image. In this parable, this living parable of the death of Ezekiel's wife, the people of God are being shown how they are going to react to the loss of this one that they take delight in, and that is Jerusalem. There always existed among the people of God, as I mentioned earlier, this assumption that God was going to take care of them no matter what, no matter how unfaithful they might be. And um, Malachi talks about this. Let me see here if I can. Malachi 3, verse 11. This was the attitude. Um, they, they latched on to this promise from God, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. This was a promise that the people of God glommed on to that God was always going to help them and it didn't matter how they treated God or whether they trusted in God. Of course, they were warned about this by the other prophets. But now, uh, with Jerusalem about ready to be destroyed by the Babylonians, this source of their hope, this delight of their eyes and their uh, lives was going to be taken away from them. And they would not be able to mourn in the way that they might have expected to because everything, uh, uh, all their traditions, everything had been taken from them. And so Ezekiel is told <clears throat> that when his wife dies, he's not to weep, he's not to show any outward signs of grief, he's not to uh, <clears throat> uh, go around barefooted, which was one of the signs of someone who was grieving. He's to put on his shoes. Uh, he's not to accept food from people. And this is a custom we still have today. I remember when someone uh, passed away up in Northwest Ohio and I was at his widow's house and the doorbell rang several times. People were bringing food in for the widow and her family. And the widow said to me, there's a lot of love in that refrigerator. Well, Ezekiel wasn't uh, to accept any kinds of expressions of uh, condolence and so forth. He was supposed to go on with his life. Um, and this is what the people of God were forced to, uh, to, to deal with. They couldn't go through the normal uh, grieving process. They had to either knuckle under the Babylonians and do their bidding and try to move on with their lives that way, or they had to get out of Jerusalem as quickly as they could. There was no time for grief or sorrow. So Ezekiel does everything that God commands him to do. Verse 18, So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died, and on the next morning... I did as I was commanded. Verse 19. And the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you are acting thus? I'm going to stop right here. For four and a half years, Ezekiel has been offering all of these oracles. Otherwise, he has remained silent. He hasn't interacted with his people other than the interactions that were required of him to deliver the oracles that God had given to him. The analogy here is of Paul, who says in the New Testament, I decided to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. So Ezekiel has deliberately um, ignored his personal life and personal interactions for the sake of the message, law, and gospel that God has called him to deliver to these people. So they're saying, you, you've got to tell us what this means. Verse 20. 
Then I said to them, the word of the Lord came to me, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes, and the yearning of your soul, and your sons and daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. Now, uh, it's interesting. God is going to send the, the Babylonians into the temple to profane his sanctuary. Well, of course, the people of God have already profaned the temple, and we talked about that before by offering uh, uh, sacrifices to false idols. And he's saying, I'm going to make sure that happens. It's going to be utterly profaned and destroyed. And your sons and daughters who are still back in Jerusalem are going to die. Verse 22, and you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads and your shoes on your feet. You shall not mourn or weep, but you shall rot away in, in your iniquities and groan to one another. This is grim. God is saying, now you're going to have to live with the consequences of your abominations. Verse 24, thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. When this comes, then you will know that I am the Lord God. When you've heard, when you've received the message that uh, the city has been destroyed, then you will know that I am God. You've been play acting up to this point. Now you will know. It's a little different twist of that formula that we see throughout Ezekiel. Then you will know that I am the Lord God. And of course, the prophet has to be willing to wait, to go out on a limb and speak the word that God has given to them and, uh, and be willing to be proven wrong. But wait steadfastly for what God says is going to happen. This is the only the second time that the name of Ezekiel is mentioned in this book, and God uses his name here. And he says that Ezekiel is assigned to you. So Ezekiel becomes a physical parable of what they're going to go through at the loss of Jerusalem. Verse 25, as for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their soul's desire, and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. On that day your mouth will be opened to the fugitive, and you shall speak and be no longer mute, so you will be assigned to them, and they will know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel is to remain silent now until a fugitive comes with the message, and this will happen um, sometime close to three years later, uh, that because the siege lasts two and a half years, and it was about six months after the siege, uh, that the fugitive arrives with the news that all that Ezekiel had told them would happen had happened to Jerusalem. So that's the end of chapter 24. And you see, it's a dramatic conclusion to everything that has preceded it. Now, we shift to chapter 25. Chapters 25 to 32... <clears throat> present oracles against the other nations in the area. And um, it's a precursor then to God giving the promise to his people who have been chastened. And he's telling them the time will come when there will be restoration. And as I mentioned, that will begin at chapter 33 and conclude with chapter 48. So those last 16 chapters of Ezekiel are basically what we would call gospel. We've had a lot of heavy writing through law up to this point. Uh, but these 
these um, oracles against the nations are a way of God underscoring a very important fact that he is not just the God of the Jews. He is the God of all nations and all peoples. And yes, he has uh, uh, disciplined his own people, but that does not give other nations in the world, other peoples in the world, the right to come after his people. They are still his people. And we, as part of the church today, who have been grafted into the Israel of God, are part of this people as well. All who trust in the God revealed to us in Jesus, Yahweh in the flesh, are part of the, the, the Israel of God. So now we're going to go very quickly, I think, uh, through um, some of these oracles, these prophecies against various nations and peoples. And uh, I, the thing that I put in the comments, which is a map that I took from the Kushal uh, commentary, might be very helpful uh, in kind of getting the lay of the land, literally, here in chapter 25. Chapter 25, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Say to the Ammonites, Hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God, because you said, Aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. They shall eat your fruit, and they shall drink your milk. I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels, and Ammon a fold for flocks. Then you will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord God, Because you have clapped your hands uh, and stamped your feet and rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel, therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you, and will hand you over as plunder to the nations. And I will cut you off from the peoples and will make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, if you look at that uh, thing that I put in the comments, that map, you'll see on it uh, Ammon. And the, the Ammonites were descendants of Lot by his younger daughter. You remember the rather sordid thing that occurred in Genesis 19, 37 to 38, when Lot, who had uh, been uh, led out of uh, Sodom on the day that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, his wife, you'll recall, looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt because she was looking back rather than looking ahead to where God was taking them. Anyway, uh, they, they end up in this little village, uh, Lot and his two daughters. And his daughters decide to take fate into their own hands. They know that uh, they don't have husbands and their prospect of having husbands is almost uh, nil. And so they hatch this plot to get their father, Lot, drunk. And then each of the girls uh, on succeeding nights sleep with their father and they uh, conceive sons. Well, one of the people who descended from that unholy union were the Ammonites. Uh, they inhabited the land that was east and north of the Dead Sea. And the, the major town was Rabbah, Rabbah or Rabbath Ammon, which is today Amman or Ammon, Jordan. Uh, but that's where the Ammonites were. The Ammonites were often allied with peoples against Israel. And they gave no assistance to the people of God when they were moving uh, toward the promised land from Egypt. 
they turned them away. And their God was Moloch. So the source of so much trouble uh, for the people of God as they acquiesced to this idol, uh, Moloch, and offered uh, sacrifices to Moloch. Um, and the Ammonites, according to Second Kings, had actually participated in the destruction of the temple uh, with the Babylonians. But what God is saying here is that he's going to turn uh, the Babylonians against them, and they are going to be uh, a memory, a distant memory. All right, we move on. Verse 8, Thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Seir, Seir is a mountain range that runs through uh, Moab, uh, because Moab and Seir said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations, therefore I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth Shemath, Baalmeon, and Kiriathaim. I will give it along with the Ammonites to the peoples of the east as a possession that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations and I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Now, once again, if you look at that map, you see Moab was um, uh, south of the Amman River and sort of southeast of the Dead Sea. The Moabites, uh, you know, we had, there were connections to the Moabites, of course, uh, by the people of God. You recall that when there was a famine in Bethlehem, uh, a woman named Naomi and her husband, along with her, uh, their two sons, went to Moab uh, to where they could find food. And eventually, Ruth, who was from, from Moab, moved back to Bethlehem with Naomi and became a, uh, a, an ancestor of King David, Israel's greatest king. Moab uh, were descendants of Lot by the other sister, the older daughter of Lot. And um, they also refused to let the people of God uh, come through their land as they were going into Canaan. Uh, and Moab also participated with Babylon in overthrowing Jerusalem. So uh, a pretty, uh, a pretty sordid history, and God is saying to these people, "Look, don't look down your noses on Judah." And what's particularly interesting in this section is where uh, God says in verse. Um, Eight, that the people of Moab had said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations. God is saying they're not like all the other nations. They are my people. Verse 12, Thus says the Lord God, Because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and is grievously offended in taking vengeance on them, therefore thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast, and I will make it desolate. From Taman even to Dedan, they shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. Now, this is an interesting prophecy. First of all, the Edomites were descendants of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. And they also had refused to help the people of God when they were trying to enter into the promised land. The Edomites joined Nebuchadnezzar in the siege of Jerusalem, joining in the plunder and, and the murder and the execution and slaughter of people. Now, what's interesting here is in this prophecy, God says <clears throat> that the pe his people, Israel, are going to be the ones who execute his punishment, his justice on Edom. And you may remember a character from uh, biblical history or interbiblical history, actually intertestamental history rather, a uh, guy who led the Maccabees 
These were the people who were involved in the events that surround Hanukkah, uh, a guy by the name of John Harkonnes. He actually led a force of his fellow Jews that uh, conquered the Edomites and brought them in uh, to Judah. And in New Testament times, that area was called Idumea. You can see Idumea, Edom, somewhat related uh, phonetically, um, was called Idumea during the uh, Greek and Roman times. So, you, for example, you see Idumea mentioned in the Gospel of Luke relative, I think, to uh, Jesus' birth. So, at any rate, yeah, that happened in 124 B.C., about 460, 70 years after the events uh, that we're talking about right now in Ezekiel. So that's interesting. I also want to make mention of two towns, Taman and Dedar. Taman and Dedar are kind of the uh, poles, if you will, of, um, of the uh, Edomite territory, like sort of extreme poles of the territory. I think that's all we'll say about that. Let's move on now to verse uh, 15. Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Cherotites and destroy the rest of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance on them. Now the Philistines, uh, you, you get a feeling for this from what God says through Ezekiel here. He's talking about their never-ending enmity toward the people of God. And of course, if you read the biblical history books, you see them, the people of God are constantly having to deal with the Philistines. All of the judges had to deal with the Philistines. Uh, Saul had to deal with them. David fought the Philistine um, uh, Goliath, uh, you'll recall, when he was uh, just a young man or a, a, an adolescent, maybe. And so uh, the Philistines were perennial uh, tormentors of the people of God. And God is saying he is going to wreak vengeance on them. Uh, the Philistine name is related to the name for this region, Palestine, uh, but they're also called the Keratites, C-H-E-R-E-T-H-I-T-E-S. And uh, the really interesting speculation about this is we know that the Philistines originally came from Crete and had sailed uh, to this, uh, this territory on the Mediterranean, the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, uh, Philistia... Their land hugged the Mediterranean Sea in much the same way that Chile down in South America hugs uh, the Pacific Ocean, just a narrow strip of land. But they were seagoing peoples and they were traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. You know, there's a lot of trade that runs through this uh, section of the world. It's kind of, if I, I think of it as an elbow that connects Europe Asia and Africa and so there were all manner of trade routes that went through here and Philistia really profited from that shipping uh, taking goods from the east and taking them as far away we know they sailed as far away as Britain and so uh, uh, this people were very powerful despite the fact that they didn't have a lot of real estate that's a little bit like um, uh, medieval Venice, you know, which was a, uh, this kind of island nation, uh, out, a dot out in the middle of the Mediterranean that wielded all manner of power uh, because it was in the midst of trading lanes and it acquired um, vast sums. But of course, it wasn't sustainable 
because they weren't big enough and couldn't field big enough armies unless they, you know, just fielded uh, nothing but uh, mercenaries. And as we've seen in events in Ukraine, mercenaries are not always terribly reliable. So Philistia is going to have vengeance wreaked upon it. Um, I'm wonder I think I'm going to stop right there. I was prepared to go on with chapter 26, but we'll pick up with chapter 26, which uh, picks up with uh, uh, or an oracle against lengthy oracle against Tyre. That name Tyre, along with Sidon, are bywords uh, in the Bible of evil and syncretism and idolatry, um, and we'll talk more about Tyre next week. Now, next Tuesday is the 4th of July, so uh, I won't be here with you on the 4th of July. I don't think you'd be with me either, um, and we will pick up. Uh, on Wednesday, July 5, and at that point, we'll dig into chapter 26, and I think chapter 27 at least, because uh, 27 continues to talk about Tyre. It's a lament over Tyre. In fact, uh, the next several chapters deal with this, uh, the tragedy of Tyre, if you will, which demonstrates uh, God's uh, dominion over all the earth, not just his own people. Well, let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would use this word to demonstrate to us the, the breadth of your power and how you are in charge of history, no matter how crazy things seem to go, and that you will uh, to save all peoples uh, by coming into our world and by Christ dying on the cross, bearing our sins and then being raised from the dead to open up eternity to all who believe. Lord, we pray that you would help us to live in daily repentance and faith, joyfully turning our lives to you and living from you who alone are worthy of all of our praise and honor and glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend as you worship God on Sunday. Maybe your church offers Saturday worship. And uh, have a great 4th of July. I'll plan on seeing you back here uh, next Wednesday night as we continue our look at Ezekiel. We're picking up the pace. God bless. Bye now.